tongue. And the prayer language is the gift of the Holy Spirit, one of many gifts of the Holy Spirit. And the Apostle Paul says when someone gets up and gives a word like that, if it's not interpreted, then it really doesn't benefit the body. So a couple of folks, delivered words in tongues, and then there is an interpretation of those tongues. Holy Spirit gave the tongue and Holy Spirit interpreted the tongue, and in it, the Lord spoke to us. How do you receive that? Amen. The thing is, if we rush through moments like that, if our program, if our schedule is more important than the Holy Spirit, then we risk scheduling the Holy Spirit out of the building. And if we don't have the presence of the Lord, we don't have anything. How many are hearing this? So we want to give the Holy Spirit control. And how many know the Lord has not called us to a Sabbath hour? He's called us to a Sabbath day. But this whole day is His. That's why when we come together at the refuge, you know, we start around 10 o'clock and we're not done until Holy Spirit says we're done. We don't want to miss anything that the Lord is doing because if we don't give the Holy Spirit freedom, then the Holy Spirit can vacate the house. And then all we have is a building. And if we just have a building, we might as well put Moose Club up in front of the door because we're no better than a club if we don't have the presence of God. It's the presence of God that changes things. It's the presence of God that opens up the dimensions of the glory. It's the presence of God that brings healing in the room. Everything we need is in the presence of God. And when the presence of God is in the room, all things are possible. How many receive that? And so the Lord manifests in the room and he can do multiple things all over the room when we honor the presence of the Lord. That's why Solomon said, don't rush out of the presence of the king. So I want to thank everybody because this group did a great job. The folks that were out here and the folks that were up here did a great job of just staying in the presence. And, and everybody just honored the Lord. There wasn't disruptive things going on. We just stayed in that place of honoring the king. When we honor him, he pours out more of his presence, his power and his anointing. He said, if you honor me, I will honor you. And so I want to thank everybody for doing that. How do you know a lot of churches would have just said, well, you know what, it's, it's 1130, it's time to get to the word. <laughs> or a lot of churches would have gone 11 to 1130, we're done. Yeah. How many hear what the Lord is saying? Yeah. Amen. But there's a blessing for those who linger. But Mary lingered at the tomb. And what happened to Mary Magdalene as she lingered at the tomb? She met him. She thought he was the gardener because she was bound by her own expectation. <laughs> But she met the Lord because she lingered. There's a blessing for those who linger. How many received that in the Lord today? All right, hallelujah. So in moments like this, especially as we have newer people coming in the body, I just want to take those teachable moments to talk about what God's doing. Amen? Hallelujah. So we just kind of understand what God is doing in the room. Hallelujah. This morning, God's got a, a message that, that's going to be delivered from the pulpit that I want to encourage you to pay close attention to because this may be one of the most unique messages that God is going to release from the pulpit this year. It's going to at least be the most unique he's, he's, he's delivered thus far. But I want to encourage you to really lay hold of this word. There's going to be three parts to this word today that if you look at those three parts as a whole and connect them together, you're going to get the total word of what God is wanting to speak to us today. How many receive that in the Lord? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So the title of this word today is going to be One Who Possesses the Furnace. One who possesses the furnace. So how many are ready to receive the word of God today? Amen. Amen. How many know that faith comes by Amen. and hearing by 
Hallelujah. So, Lord Jesus, right now, we just release you the word in this place. Lord Jesus, we release you the word in the broadcast today. Lord, we release you over the Rock River Valley region. Lord Jesus, we release you over the apostolic state of Illinois. Lord Jesus, we release you over our nation. We release you over Israel. We release you over India. We release you over the earth this day, Lord Jesus. We release the name of Jesus. And Lord Jesus, I thank you that in your name there is power. In your name there is healing. In your name there is salvation. There's no other name under heaven given to men by which they can be saved but the name of Jesus. We lift up your name in this place. And Lord Jesus, we ask as we lift up your name today, may you open the dimensions of the glory of the Lord in this place. Lord Jesus, you are the glory. Lord Jesus, all glory is yours. You will share your glory with no other. So Lord Jesus, may your word today be a key that unlocks the doors and dimensions of revelation that we've never heard before in this place. Lord, you said that you will give to us the treasures hidden in darkness. Lord Jesus, you are our treasure. You are our pearl of great price. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would teach us today. Open up the eyes of our hearts so that Jesus will be revealed to us. And Lord, I speak wherever this word goes today, the breakthrough anointing is going to go. Lord, I declare wherever this word goes today, there's going to be a release of revelation knowledge. Lord, I decree wherever this word goes today, there's going to be the opening of doors that the enemy has tried to hold shut. Lord, I decree and declare this word today, a breaker word. In Jesus' name, we pray today, for Lord, you're the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by you. And everybody said, Amen. Hallelujah. If you have the word this morning, let's go to Revelation chapter 2 and verse 1. And we're going to start out this morning with a passage that the Lord had me teach on several weeks ago. But the Lord wants us to be reminded of this passage. And then he wants to springboard off this passage and to begin to show us something that we've never seen before. And I decree and declare the word that is released today is not going to return void, but it's going to accomplish its purpose. I declare that there is an anointing of acceleration over the seed that's being released from this pulpit, and it will very quickly go into the ground, root deeply below, and bear fruit above. For we are in the season of Genesis 26, 12. And Isaac planted a seed in the ground and that year received a hundredfold harvest. I decree and declare that our God is accelerating the things that the enemy has tried to hold back. I decree and declare our God has the keys of David in his hands and he's opening up doors that no one can close. And he's closing doors so that no one can open them. He is releasing dimensions in the realm of the Spirit of the church, the church has never walked in before. How do you receive that in Jesus' name? I want to start out by saying this this morning. The key to everything that you're wanting to see Jesus do in your life is intimacy with Him. The key to everything you want to see God doing in your family is you being the forerunner and walking in intimacy with Jesus. The key to us seeing God move in the Rock River Valley Revival region and our apostolic state and our nation and the earth is God's people walking in intimacy with the bridegroom, the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And if you're like me and you're crying out for deeper dimensions of the Lord, the Spirit of God is saying those dimensions are unlocked through intimacy with Jesus. There is no shortcut to this. There is no, the Lord is going to come over you and just drop upon you a dimensional anointing like never before. I'm telling you guys, the dimensions of the glory of the anointing of God are opened up through the relentless pursuit of intimacy with Jesus. And I want us to understand that from the start today so that we don't get off track with this word. How many receive that? All right, if you've got the word today, Revelation chapter 2 and verse 1, please stand just to honor the word of the Lord in the initial reading. How many know in, in Revelation, whoo, hallelujah, chapters 2 and 3, the Lord goes to the seven churches, and the seven churches represent the churches at the end of the age. And he gives to each one of them a report card. 
And we can learn something from the report card that he gives to each of the churches because those churches represent the seven churches that are in the earth today. How many know we need to make sure we're in the right church? Yeah. Hallelujah. Functioning as the Lord wants it to you. Now notice in Revelation 2.1, the word says, to the angel or to the messenger of the church of Ephesus, right? These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and who walks among the seven golden lampstands. Now I want you to notice what he says here. He says, I know. He's going to say, I know seven times. He says this. He says, I know your works or your deeds, your hard work and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked men, that you've tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them to be false. And you've persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. How many know it's a great report card thus far for the church at Ephesus? But in my NIV, the next word is yet. John says in his Bible, his translation, kitty corner to me, the word is nevertheless. So notice what he says. Nevertheless, I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. How do you know that the Lord loves us and he loves us so much that he's not willing to allow us to remain the way that we were when he found us? And so he commends this church. He said, you have good works and you have perseverance and you haven't grown weary and you're pressing through. The problem is somewhere along the way, you let go of me and now you've got the form but not the function. Now you've got the form but not the unction. Now you've got the activity but not the intimacy. And you've kept going after you have released your first love and notice what he says remember the height from which you have fallen remember and do the things you did at first how many know the Lord never identifies a problem without giving the solution yeah. amen he never leaves us in the dark the Holy Spirit always paints a complete picture if we're willing to listen but now notice what the Lord says but if you do not repent I will come to you and, rem and I will remove your lampstand from its place. Yeah. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, whom I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the, to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life which is in the paradise of God or the paradise garden of God. Please be seated this morning. Hallelujah. Now it's very interesting as we look at the seven churches in the book of Revelation and the seven churches are a picture of the church today. We've got to understand this. When we read through, if you haven't studied the seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3, I want, you to, I want to encourage you to do so because in each of those churches, you see what's going on in the church today. And I really believe out of the two report, two of the report cards out of the seven that God gives really cause us to need to listen very closely and pay attention as the end times church. One is the report card that he gave to Laodicea. And he says to Laodicea, I wish you were either hot or cold, but because you're lukewarm, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. How can he spew that church out of his mouth? Because they were in him. Paul says for those who are in Christ Jesus. And what does he say? I wish you were one or the other. I wish you were hot or cold, but because you're neither, you're lukewarm. You're just kind of hanging in there in that place. You're not growing. You're not moving. You're not pursuing intimacy anymore. You're just kind of sitting there in the church pew. I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. We also need to pay attention to what he says to the church in Ephesus. Because in the church in Ephesus, they had all of the activity, but they lacked the intimacy. Mm -hmm. 
The intimacy they had at the beginning, and it spurred the activity, but somewhere along the line, there was a subtle shift. And how many know the shift from intimacy with Jesus to a lot of activity regarding Jesus is a subtle shift. It doesn't happen to you all at once. The enemy doesn't come to you one day and says, you know what, why don't you shift from intimacy to activity? Why don't you go from fruitfulness to barrenness? Why don't you go from the river to the dry creek bed? Because if he did, what would we do as the church? Whoa, wait a minute here. I don't want anything to do with that. It happens subtly. Mm How -hmm. many hear this? Mm -hmm. It's a daily decision that's a slippery slope. And so the Lord says to the church in Ephesus, and he says to every single one of the churches, he says this, I know your works. I know your works. Mm -hmm. I know your works. I know your works. Mm -hmm. What does that tell us as, as the church? How many know God doesn't miss anything that we do? Amen. Mm -hmm. And one of the things the enemy wants to try to tell the church today is that God doesn't see. But how many know the word says, we serve the God who sees. The eyes of the Lord go to and fro throughout the earth looking for those whose hearts are after him. God's eyes are always looking. He's always seeing, always perceiving. He knows all things. So the Lord doesn't miss a thing. And we've got to understand that in the Lord, whether it's things we're involved in that are good and of Him, and things that are on the opposite end of the spectrum. How do you know that God doesn't miss a thing? Now it's interesting here because to each of the churches, the Lord says, I know your works, or your or the or the Lord says, I know your deeds. That word works in the Greek is ergon, E-R-G-O-M, and it means this. Your works, your tasks, your actions, your accomplishments, your work that is carried out by an inner desire. Isn't that interesting? So the Lord says, I see all these things. I see your works, I see your tasks, I see your actions, I see your accomplishments, I see your work that is carried out by an inner desire. And what was the desire of the church at Ephesus? I want you to note this. They were hard workers or hard laborers. They persevered and they endured hardships. They didn't tolerate wickedness. They tested those that claimed to be apostles. And in the midst of this, they did not grow weary. How many know those are all good attributes of a church? But a church can have the best attributes, but if they don't have intimacy with Jesus, they're a barren branch. Mm -hmm. And right now, I believe the Lord is wanting to deliver this word. He's speaking this word through His precious Holy Spirit to the church in our generation. He's saying you've got the activity, but you don't have the intimacy. And because of that, when the times get really difficult, your love is going to wax cold and you're going to fall away. That's the danger of activity without intimacy. But it's very interesting that intimacy spurs activity. How many? Come on. So we just had a 72-hour burn here at the refuge. It was incredible. How many know, though, you could have come and participated in all 72 hours and missed Jesus in the process? If you didn't come in surrendered, submitted, pursuing God, hungry for Him, pressing in, going, Lord, I'm not going to leave this place until, Lord, I feel Your presence and I hear Your voice and You change me. How many know we could come to the 72-hour burn and set all the boundaries on God and come in and do our thing and leave and not be more any more intimate with Jesus than we were when we came in the door? That's the danger of activity without intimacy. We can be doing all the right things, but they're not driven out of intimacy with Jesus. How many understand that? What happens when we're doing that? We're kind of going through the motions. And you know what God says to Ephesus? He says, you're going through some good motions. On the outside, you look very fruitful. In fact, God says five positive things about them. And in the Hebrew, the number five is a picture of salvation, a sign of grace, a sign of fruitfulness. In fact, in Hebrew, the number five is the number hey, and it's a picture of the breath of God that God breathed into Adam. Everything looked great on the surface. 
But when the master came, they were like the fig tree. They were green and leafy and in season. But when Jesus pulled the leaves away, he found no fruit. And what did he do? He cursed the fig tree. And the Lord says right now, I am going to begin to curse the trees that look good to man, but are barren when the master shows up. Mm -hmm. So what happened to the church in Ephesus when Jesus showed up? He saw a green leafy fig tree with no figs. Yeah. And how many know there's a lot of people in the church like that today? They look good. They're doing the right things. They know the right phrases, right? They know how to dress. They know how to act. They know when to show up. It's a lot of activity, but they don't have a passion for Jesus that's driving it. And I believe that's a great danger for the church. How many are hearing this? Yeah. This is very, very important because the Lord says this. He says, I have this against you. How many know when our bridegroom has something against us as his bride? We need to stop in our tracks. Yes. Yes. And we need to go, okay, Lord, what's going on? See, God is looking for a generation right now that will not give him the boundaries. He's looking for a generation that will let him set the boundaries. What do you mean by that, Pastor? He's looking for a generation who doesn't say, well, Lord, I'm just going to give you this, and I'm just going to give you this, and you can have this much time, and I'm going to spend this much time with you, but you know what? I'm really going to be in control of how this breaks down. The Lord says, I'm looking for a generation who's like Mary, who when I spoke an impossible word to her, said, Lord, let it be unto me according to thy word. She really said to the Lord, Lord, everything that I am, everything that I have is yours. Use me the way that you want to. You set the boundaries. You determine what's going to happen. You lead me and I will follow. That's the generation that the Lord is looking for right now. Anyone that is setting the limits on God and the boundaries and telling him what you're going to do and what you're not going to do, you run the risk of going to the church at Ephesus. And how many know God wants to break us loose from that? Can I hear an amen? amen? Now, this is interesting. The Lord says, this is what I have against you. And we go into the King James. The Lord said, you have forsaken your first love. Mm -hmm. And that word forsaken in the Greek is amphiomi. It's A-M-P-I-E-M-I. -E and I want you to grab a hold of this. It means to send away, to leave alone, to release or to permit to depart. Let me say that again. It means to send away, to, to leave alone, to release, to permit to depart. So what does that mean when the Lord says, you've forsaken your first love? It isn't like they had a business meeting one day and decided we don't want Jesus in the building any longer. We're going to evict him. They let him slowly depart the building. And he departed a little more every time that they scheduled him out. He departed a little more every time they shifted from doing something out of intimacy with Jesus to doing something for a humanitarian purpose. They shifted, he, he moved out of the building a little bit more every time they showed up on a Sunday morning more out of duty than out of hunger. Oh, come on now, church. Yeah. And he departed the building and they let him Depart. Is anybody catching this? Mm -hmm. There's very, very few times in your life that the enemy is ever going to do things like a, a freight train in the night. Many times it's a, a subtle, slippery slope. And then all of a sudden, you're like Ephesus and the Lord is saying to you, remember the height from which you've fallen. How many are catching this? Hallelujah. And the Lord right now is crying out to the church and saying, I'm calling you back to intimacy with me. I'm calling you back to intimacy with me. Return to me and I will return to you, the Lord is saying. Is anybody hearing what the Lord is saying? You know what he was really saying to the church at Ephesus? You can do all the right things and still be wrong. And yeah, that's scary. You can do all the right things and still be wrong. Why did the Lord curse the roots of the fig tree that seemed very unjesus like He did it because he hates things that appear one way, but they're really another. Yes. That's why he said to Ephesus, you know what? You're doing all the right things. 
You're touching people. You're feeding the poor. You're building houses for habitat for humanity. You're doing great stuff. You're even reading the Word. But you let me depart somewhere in the process. And now you've got all the activity, but none of the intimacy. And the Lord says, if you don't do three things, the Lord says, then I'm going to have to come and I'm going to take your lampstand. How many know that's as serious as the message that he gave to Laodicea? It's as serious as a message. This church had a lot of great things going on, but intimacy with Jesus had been forsaken. This is the danger of where many in the end times church are at right now. Right. Where intimacy is starting to give way to activity. Yeah. And when that happens, we have a form of godliness, but we deny the power thereof. And the Lord is saying, right now, I want you to search your heart, and I want you to listen to my Holy Spirit in any way in your life that you have begun to allow me to depart. And the Lord is saying, here's the word I have for you today. Return to me. Return to me. Return to me. Now, it's interesting because the Lord doesn't just identify the issue he says, I want you to do these three things. What did Jesus say to the church at Ephesus? He said, I want you to remember what it was like to be intimate with me. Has anybody had gone into the secret place recently and the presence of the Lord is kind of waning in the room and you think to yourself, Lord, I remember when I'd walk in the room and your presence would meet me there. Okay, the Lord says, don't just have a momentary reflection. Cause that to stir your heart to cry out to him and press him for an intimacy that you lost. He says, remember the height from which you've fallen. Remember when you were here. Look at where you're at now. Look and remember what it was like to be intimate with me and cause that to stir your heart to hunger and press in afresh and anew. The Lord said, don't just observe, don't just hear, but also do. He says, I know your works, you're doing the right, you're doing all kinds of right things, but you're still wrong. And I've got a problem with this, says the Lord. The Lord says, secondly, he said, I want you to repent. The Lord said, because you've forsaken me, you need to repent before me. What is, the, what is repentance in the New Testament or even in the Old Testament? It means to change one's mindset. It means to turn around. Yeah. Yeah. Come on. So what does it mean to repent? To not just say, Lord, I'm sorry. Next time I'm in the secret place, I'm going to try harder. It's not about trying harder. It's about surrendering. Mm -hmm. Trying harder is activity. Yeah. Surrendering leads to intimacy. Yeah. Come on. And what was the challenge with Ephesus? They were trying so hard and pushing so hard that somehow it turned into, I'm going to just tie up my bootstraps here, then I'm just not going to give up. But they were doing it in their own ability. Mm -hmm. And the Lord says, I want you to repent of that. And I want you to turn. This is what I've been doing. This is how I've been doing it. This is how I've set boundaries on you. I'm going to turn from that and I'm going to go after you, Jesus. Mm -hmm. yeah. Isn't that what he said? And then secondly, he said, I want you to do this, and this is so important. He says, I want you to re-engage. Mm -hmm. He said, I want you to go back and do the things you once did. Come on. Yes. I've got an amazing wife in this room. She's an incredible woman of God. She's a gift from God. How many know the word says, when a man finds a wife, he finds a good thing in the favor of the Lord? The majority of the favor that I walk in is because of her. And, and I'm just going to put that out there. And she is an amazing woman of God that works hard behind the scenes so I can do the things that God has called me to do. She's as much a pastor in this house as I am. It just looks different. How do you receive that? And I just bless you right now, babe. I just love you in the Lord. You're a gift from God. And so are my kids. Amen. Hallelujah. But it's interesting, you know, when a man meets a woman and they start dating... He does things. He does things that he doesn't normally do, like write love letters. Suddenly men become poets who have never read, you know, Henry David Thoreau. You know, suddenly they're just caught up on cloud nine and they're buying gifts and they're showing up uninvited and all this romantic stuff is going on. 
But the problem a lot of times we have with men is we're great in the pursuit. But once we catch what we're pursuing, we don't always know what to do. Right? A lot of times men are great at pursuits, but not great at intimacy. And that's somewhere as men that we need to learn from the Holy Spirit. I've learned in my walk that I don't truly know how to love my wife until I really listen to the Holy Spirit and allow him to teach me how to love her. Is anybody hearing this? Yeah. But what can happen, men? Then we get married and all of a sudden, where's the poetry? Where's the love letters? Where's the little Hallmark cards? Right? Where's the little gifts? Why? Because we've accomplished our goal. I pursued her and I got her. Now what do I do? The problem with the church is they pursued him and they've encountered some of the initial realms of glory, but then they've stopped there. And somewhere along the lines, they went, that's enough. They, they have experienced initial intimacy, and somewhere they stopped. You want to know one of the reasons why we stop in pursuit of intimacy with Jesus? Is because we get to somewhere with Jesus in the intimate moments where he wants to deal with something that we're not willing to let him deal with. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so we just kind of pull away when he gets to a wall or a hurt or a room that we're standing like this in front of, or when he starts wanting something very precious to us that we're not willing to let go of, like our time mm -hmm. or our affection. And he says, I'm looking for a generation that won't put time limits on me, that will give me their every moment, because I said, I will be your God, you will be my people, and I will dwell amongst you. Hallelujah. You want to know what the Lord Jesus wants to do? He wants to dwell with you. And when you dwell with someone, your entire life changes. Yeah. Men, when we get married, we go from being able to set our own schedule to all of a sudden there's someone else involved in this. Oh. <laughs> and as men, if we're not careful, we can be married but still live like we're single. <laughs> you might hear what I'm saying? Yeah. And ladies, maybe you can do this in your own way too. But all of a sudden we're married and there's this amazing woman that moves into the house and all of a sudden she wants half your closet space. <laughs> Holly and I get married. She starts taking over half the closet. I said, what are you doing? She said, half of yours is mine. I said, wait a minute. What happens? I said, there's a great closet downstairs. She said, absolutely, your stuff will look great in it. And I said, what just happened? See, when she showed up, my entire life changed. But it changed for the better. See, I had to give up some things, but I gained so much more. Sometimes we get to a point of intimacy with Jesus where we just feel like he just wants this and he wants this and he wants this and he wants this and he wants that and he wants this. And we back away when the truth is he really wants very little in comparison to what he wants to give us. Right? And so I think in Ephesus, the subtle shift was, didn't happen in a business meeting. If you interviewed the team at Ephesus, when Jesus was giving the critique, they'd say, man, we're a great church. We're, we're doing stuff. We're out every weekend. Man, we're, we're having 72-hour prayer burns. There's all kinds of great stuff going on. And what does Jesus say? I've got something against you. You're doing all these things without me now. You're not doing them through intimacy with me. You're doing them through your own anointing and gifts and efforts. You took the anointing of the Holy Ghost that I gave you and you're using it now to function without intimacy with me. Mm -hmm. You know what the Lord said? If you don't repent, if you don't remember, if you don't re-engage, the Lord said, then I'm going to have to take your golden candlesticks. Mm -hmm. God is about to do this in the church in our generation. Okay. He's about to deal with the church with all the wonderful programs and all the wonderful things you can plug into and all the wonderful activities that aren't functioning out of intimacy with Him. He is going to level those houses. He's going to take their golden lampstand. Yeah. But is that, his how, is that His heart? No, right now He's going to those churches and He's saying, remember, repent, and re-engage. Mm -hmm. And there may be maybe some people that are hearing this word right now. He's saying to you, remember, repent, and re-engage. How many are hearing this? Well, you know what? Things have just kind of slid a little bit, but they're not that bad. <laughs> Jesus never looks at anything as not that bad. What did he say to Laodicea? I wish you were hot or cold. What's in the middle? Not that bad. 
Yeah. Come on, Luke Ward. How many are hearing this? Yeah. Right? You go to the coffee pot. You pour some coffee. You're not paying attention to how long it's been there. You put it to your lips, and oh, that's not that's that's not that's not been warmed up. Somebody turned off the burner on that coffee pot. You know what the Lord is saying to the church right now? I want you to be hot or cold. In between doesn't work for me. Come on. How many know my precious wife? She wants me to either be completely in love with him, with her, or not. Come on. She didn't want a husband going through the motions. She wants me to love her with all my heart that I can love her with. How many are getting that? How many know Jesus wants a bride that's the same? That's why he's not coming back for the church. He's coming back for his bride. Who is his bride? The one that is making herself ready. Come on, how's she doing it, church, through intimacy? How's she doing it through intimacy? But I want you to notice something beautiful that Jesus says here. He uses the sandwich method. You're doing great. I've got this against you. But if you'll do this, then you're going to be amazed at what I'm about to do. I call that the sandwich principle. I want you to notice what he says here. And this is verse 7. He says this. He says, To he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Who's speaking to the church right now? The Spirit of God. The same Spirit of God that breathed life into Adam is speaking to the church. And at the end of the age, the intimate bride remnant church partners with the Spirit of God and the Spirit and the Bride say, come. They say, Bo. We were singing that today in the prayer circle. Bo, 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 Bo. And the Spirit and the Bride say, come. Come, come. Notice what he says. He says, to him who overcomes, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Yeah. Now this is interesting. If you take this back into the Greek and reference it into the Hebrew, the Lord literally says this. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the pleasure garden of God. What did David say? Lord, at your right hand is what? Pleasures forevermore. Absolutely. See, when we think about God, we don't think about pleasure. Because to us, pleasure comes out of eros. Right? It comes out of the word erotic. And we think pleasure and we never think anything good. That's the enemy. The Lord says, taste and see that I am good. There are pleasures at my right hand forevermore. They're just the right pleasures. See, we don't think of God and think pleasure. We think of God and we think discipline, requirement, restrictions, rules, orders. Let's be honest. But you know what? The Lord Jesus wants us to come into his pleasure garden. Song of Songs. My lover is a garden enclosed. Ooh. So it's very interesting. We go back to the book of Genesis. Law first mentioned. What's the first garden? Is the Garden of Eden. What was the Garden of Eden all about? Adam and Eve taking pleasure in God and fellowshipping with him. And the rabbis have taught for generations that the Garden of Eden existed outside of time. That's what they taught. And they taught that Adam and Eve dwelled in a garden that was outside of time and they could step from the garden into the earthly realm back to the garden, but they met the Lord in the garden. Isn't that interesting? And when they sinned, they had to leave the garden. And what does God do? He puts two cherubim in front of the garden with what? Flaming swords so no one can get in. If Eden truly existed between in, in a realm that, that was apart from time, who was he trying to keep out? I don't think it was Adam and Eve. See, it was always God's heart that we dwelled with him in his pleasure garden. 
But when sin came, sin separated us from God. And because the first Adam sinned, all who were in him sinned and had to step out of the garden. So the Lord puts the cherubim with the flaming swords in the entrance. I don't think it was to keep man out because his heart was for man always to be there. I think it was to keep the enemy out. Mm -hmm. So now we go back to Revelation. Now we go forward into Revelation and the second Adam has come and he has brought life and freedom from the sin of the first Adam. Mm -hmm. And what happens when Jesus dies and he's on the cross? He says, it is finished. What he really said was this, I have accomplished my goal, bride come forth. And the moment Jesus said it is finished, this mighty, thick, tall, wide curtain that separated people from the Holy of Holies and had two cherubim on it, split in half between the two cherubim. You know what the Lord was saying? The pleasure garden is now open again through my blood. Come on. There's revelation in that. Don't just amen me. Get the revelation of it. Eden is open again. What was so amazing about Eden? The Lord came every night and walked with them. They dwelled with God. I'm telling you, church, through intimacy with Jesus, he wants to take us from Eden to Eden. And then what's eternity going to be? Eden with him forevermore. He hasn't changed. He's the same God from Genesis to Revelation. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. How many are hearing what the Lord is saying? Yes. Now, this is interesting because I always ask the Lord, what are you talking about? Anybody ever done that before? Mm -hmm. I was the kid that got in trouble all the time growing up because mom and dad would say, don't do that. And I'd say, why? I wouldn't question their authority. I want to know why I shouldn't do it. Yeah. Right? Because I don't want to do something and I don't realize why I'm not doing it. Help me understand. Right? So all, this, all, all the time, my mom had a wonderful southern back elbow. <laughs> right? Don't do that, Andrew. Why? Pow! I get the elbow, right? Hallelujah. I had a southern mother. She was from southern Israel. Hallelujah. So, <laughs> some of you got that. All right. Praise God. So, <laughs> Hallelujah. Anyway, so I want you to see this because this is interesting. The Lord says in verse 7, to him who overcomes. Here's my question. Who overcomes what? To him who overcomes. I want you to understand this. I was talking to the Lord about this yesterday in our 72-hour burn. And I said, Lord, I said, overcomes what? He said, the tendency of the end times church to focus on works and not intimacy. He said, that's going to be the great, subtle bait of the enemy at the end of the age. If he doesn't get you with unforgiveness or offense, he's going to try to get you with works that don't come out of intimacy with him. Is anybody getting this? And by the way, what's happening right now with the church? Churches are compromising and churches are becoming more humanitarian in what they're doing. Come on. There's a Christian organization that uh, Holly and I have supported here and there. We supported them and they sent us a newsletter. I opened up that newsletter and Christian is literally in the title of that organization. I went through the whole six-page newsletter. God wasn't mentioned once. Jesus wasn't mentioned much. And there was no scripture in it at all. All, of, all it was was we fed these people and we built these houses and we did this and we did that. And we hope sometime we get to share the message with them. And Holy Spirit said to me, don't send them another check. Okay. Send the check to organizations that are making me known. Yeah. Amen. Yes. Is anybody hearing what the Lord is saying? Mm -hmm. So that word overcome that's used here in Greek is nikao. It's N-I-K-A-O. And it means to conquer, to prevail. Are you ready for this? To subdue, to be victorious. I want to camp out on a word, and we're going to talk about this word a couple more times before we're done today, to subdue. What was one of the things that God told Adam to do? Amen. To subdue the earth. Mm -hmm. What did it mean? To have children that were going to occupy the earth? No, to bring the earth under submission to God. Is anybody catching that? So when you go to your in your home with oil on your hands and you pray through it, 
You're subduing your home. You're taking authority over your home, over your property, and saying, Lord, it's yours. The Lord is looking for a radical, remnant, intimate group of people that He can send out to subdue the earth through His resurrection power. Hallelujah. And we're part of that group. So we can literally read this passage in verse 7. To him who subdues. To him who subdues. What are you going to subdue? First of all, you're going to partner with the Holy Spirit in sanctification to allow the Holy Spirit how to teach you to subdue your flesh mm-hmm. and your soul. Mm-hmm. And then the Holy Spirit is going to teach you through that how to walk in the Spirit. Is anybody hearing this? Mm-hmm. See, this is part of the process. By the way, then once you do that, you can teach others how to do that. And be used by God to help bring the earth under submission. See, God says through intimacy with me, I'm about to teach you things you've never known. And through that, I'm unlocking doors for you to walk in things you've never walked in before. But it's through intimacy with me. That's why the end times church is going to look like nothing the earth has ever seen before. Come on. So here, the Lord says seven times to seven churches, He said, I know your works. I know your works. I know your works. I see what you're doing. But it's not about what you're doing. It's about intimacy with me. And we've got to understand that. Because your works don't get you into heaven. The shed blood of Jesus gets you into heaven. And then the works that are done through intimacy with Jesus, with the right heart and with the right purpose, will turn into rewards in heaven. What happens to things that aren't done out of intimacy with Jesus that are maybe done so we can be seen and so we can use our gifts? They are wood, hay, and stubble. And I don't think this gets taught in the church enough that our works are going to go through the fire. Our works are going to go through the fire. Our works are going to go through the fire. Our works are going to go through the fire. But you know what's interesting that Jesus does here? He connects works with salvation. He says, church, I don't want you to do works out of duty and out of activity. And because we're the church, we need to do something. He said, I want you to do works because you're saved and you're so totally in love with me and intimate with me that works are a natural outgrowth of that process. Hallelujah. And it's the right works for the right reason. Is anybody hearing what the Lord is saying? Let's go to Isaiah chapter 58. How many are receiving the word of the Lord today? Okay. Now we're going to shift here in a couple moments. And he says this to Israel. He says, shout it aloud and don't hold back. And raise your voice like a trumpet. And declare to my people their rebellion. And to the house of Jacob their sons. For day after day, they seek me out. Whoa. Report card. Day after day, they seek me out. Is that not a good thing for God to say? Day after day, they seek me out. But notice what he says after that. They seem eager to know my ways. Uh Uh-oh. We've got a problem. They seem eager to know my ways as if They were a nation that does what is right and has not forsaken the commands of its God. They ask me for just decisions and seem eager for God to come near them. Do you know what? This is what Ephesus did. Is anybody catching this? This is what Ephesus did. They seemed eager. They seemed to be doing the right thing. They seemed a lot of things. How many are hearing this? Yes. But what happened? It wasn't coming out of intimacy with the Lord. And the Lord knows whether we're doing something out of intimacy or whether we're doing it out of duty. Yeah. Yeah. How many churches are doing things out of duty right now and not intimacy? Yeah. If we do that, we are going to have to fear our love growing cold and us falling away at the end of the age. Mm -hmm. Okay, 
Now I want us to keep reading what the Lord says here. He says, why have we, why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen it? Didn't the Lord just say, I see your works in Revelation 2? Why have we humbled ourselves and you haven't noticed? Yet on the day of your fasting, you do as you please. And you exploit all your workers. Your fasting ends in quarreling and strife and in striking hands with each other. You're striking each other with wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. You know what the Lord is saying here? You can't do it your way and expect for me to hear your voice anymore. God is saying that to the church right now. He's saying if you keep doing it your way, your voice is not going to be heard on high. How many know that we serve the King of Kings, not the Burger King? We can't have it our way. Yeah. Okay, is anybody catching that? So notice what he says, church. I mean, this, this is important that we get this, and this strikes our hearts, right? He says, you cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. Now here he is giving the answer. Is this the kind of fast I've chosen? Only a day for a man to humble himself? Is it only for bowing one, one's head like a reed and for lying on sackcloth and ashes? Is that what you call a fast? A day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the kind of fasting I've chosen? Now the Lord says, okay, let me tell you what I want. To loose the chains of injustice. To untie the cords of the yoke. To set the oppressed free. To break every yoke. Is it not to share your food with the hungry? And to provide the poor. with The poor wanderer with shelter. When you see the naked, clothe him. And do not turn away from your own flesh and blood. Now by the way, wasn't Ephesus doing those things? But they weren't doing them out of intimacy, which is God's way. How many know we've got Isaiah 61.1 all over this building now? We can do Isaiah 61, but not God's way. We can heal the brokenhearted and set the captives free. We can open up prison doors in our own anointing and ability. Not out of intimacy with Him. Is anybody catching that? So the Lord says if we truly want to walk out Isaiah 61, it's done through intimacy with Him. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. That all the activity that comes in the next verses come out of abiding and dwelling with Him intimately. Is anybody hearing what the Lord is saying? And notice what he says in verse 8, the Hebrew number of new beginnings. If you'll do this, then your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness or the righteous one will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call on the Lord and he'll answer and you'll cry out for help and he'll say, here I am. Is anybody catching this? The Lord says, church, and this has been a big word we've been hearing lately, the word alignment. He says, church, when you come in alignment with me, then your light is going to break through like the dawn. When you come in alignment with me and do it my way out of intimacy, then you will hear my voice and I will say, here I am. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, he's not playing with us today, church. He says, then you will call and the Lord will answer. Adonai will answer. When you cry for help, he'll say, here I am. If you do away with the yoke of oppression, with the pointing finger and malicious talk, you know what God wants to do right now in the church? Take the strife out. Yeah. And people come to church when we should be ministering the Lord, but instead they're going to each other. Right? The Lord hates strife. He hates malicious talk. Did you see what, see what sister so-and-so wore today? Did you see her up on the prayer carpet? She was just waving that banner and she was just doing so. Everybody saw her in the old building. Did you see that? And what's the Lord doing? He wants us to look at our own lives and examine them. And not point our finger. Holy Ghost can take care of whoever's waving a flag if they're not doing it right. 
right? And if you spend yourselves in behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness and your night will become like the noonday. Grab a hold of this. The Lord will guide you always and he will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land and will strengthen your frame. And you'll be like a well-watered garden, my pleasure garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. Your people will rebuild the ancient ruins and will raise up the age-old foundations. And I want you to notice the second part of this verse. And you will be called a repairer of broken walls, a restorer of streets with dwellings. Back when Pastor Cindy and I were in youth ministry, 20 years ago, hallelujah, we heard this read, didn't we, Pastor Cindy? And you will be a repairer of broken walls and restorer of streets with dwellings. That's never left my spirit. From the first time I heard that spoken, do you know what? None of that happens until we start doing it God's way through intimacy with Him. And there's a lot of people in the church going, why aren't we seeing the glory? Why am I not hearing my voice? Why does the seed not seem to be blessed? Why isn't this happening? Why isn't that happening? Because the Lord is saying, you're doing a lot of things, but you're not doing it my way out of intimacy with me. Therefore, I cannot bless it. And folks, we've got to have the favor and the blessing of the Lord on our lives at the end of the age for anything to happen the way that God wants it to happen. I don't know. Is anybody hearing what the Lord is saying here? Pretty good. So what's God really saying in Isaiah 58, 1 through 12? He's saying this. We don't need activity. We need intimacy. Mm -hmm. Pastor Cindy, can you give us James 2, 26, please? What we need is less activity and more intimacy. And I want you to hear this because this is important. When you hear me say less activity and more intimacy, if immediately you think, but I'm not going to be able to get all these things done that need to be done in the church. If we will focus on intimacy with Jesus, he will multiply our time and make it more effective. Yes. What did he say to Israel? When you come into the land, plant six years. And the seventh year allow the land to grow fallow. Yeah. If you'll do that, you will harvest so much in the sixth year, it will carry you it through the seventh year, and you'll still be eating the proceeds of year six in the eighth year. Yes. See, it's doing it God's way, and then the blessing of God is on it. What did Israel do? They planted, and they planted, and they planted, and they ignored the Sabbath principle for the land. Finally, after they ignored 10 Sabbath cycles of seven years, the Lord said to them, okay, you've ignored my way of doing this for 70 years. Therefore, I'm going to send a king and he's going to conquer the land and you're going to go into captivity for 70 years. Is anybody catching this? The Lord said, then when you come back, you'll do it my way. Hello? Is anybody hearing what God's saying? Okay. So I want you to notice this. The word says this, as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. What did Jesus keep saying? I know your works. I know your deeds. I know your works. I know your deeds. Let me ask you a question. Are works bad? No. No. If they're the outgrowth of intimacy with Jesus. Do you know one of the famous reformers actually said, I wish I could rip this verse out of the Bible forever. Because he struggled with it. He struggled with works being associated with faith, being associated with salvation. He struggled with that. You know what? Do you know why works go forth from my life? Because I have faith that comes through intimacy with Jesus. Therefore, there are works that I do, but they're intimate works. And their work so that Jesus gets the glory. Yes. Yes. So you know what I really believe he was saying? Faith without corresponding action is dead. Okay? So I'm talking to the Lord about this yesterday, and the Lord said this to me. He said, intimacy builds our faith, and faith produces action, the right action with the right motives. 
Let me say that again. The Lord said this to me yesterday. Intimacy builds our faith and produces action, the right action with the right motives. Because let me tell you guys what we want to hear the Lord say. When we stand before him, we want him to say what is in Matthew 25, 21. Well done, thou good and faithful now let me ask you a question. What does a servant do? They serve. What is serving? Action. Okay? But at the end of the age in the church, there's going to be faithful servants and unfaithful servants. Unfaithful servants are doing it their way. Faithful servants are doing it God's way. And you want God to say to you, well done, thou good and faithful servants. Not just servants, good and faithful servants. Mm -hmm. Is anybody hearing that? Mm -hmm. Okay, You've heard me tell the encounter that a guy had in heaven and he saw a famous evangelist before the throne of God with his intercessor right next to him. And this famous evangelist had all these piles of things that he had done and books written and was well known and services preached and all that. And this little lady had a little book in her hand, his intercessor. And he said, all of a sudden, a door opened from the throne of God and fire came out and burned up everything this famous evangelist had. Yeah. Everything was ash around him. And the Lord just said to him, welcome to everything that I've prepared for you, is what God said to him. Then the Lord goes to his intercessor, takes the book and opens it up and there's liquid gold in it. And the Lord pulls out the liquid gold, goes to the throne, fashions it in a crown, puts jewels in it, and puts it on her head. And he looks at her and says, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into everything that I've prepared for you from the foundations of the world. You want to hear the Lord say to you, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. But I also want to hear the Lord say of me what he said to David, You fulfilled my purpose in your generation. I want to hear the Lord say both. Mm -hmm. Why? Because what we do on earth matters. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to shift here and I want to cover a couple more things. So please stay with me because this is important. Why do we do works? To receive rewards? No. no. Because we love Jesus, we're intimate with Jesus, and he said, greater things than what I did, you will do. Isaiah 61 will only be fulfilled through intimacy with Jesus. That's the only way we're going to heal the broken heart and set the captives free and set at liberty those who sit in darkness and give them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise in the place of the spirit of despair. How do we become mighty oaks of righteousness of Isaiah 61? Is anybody getting that? Because the word says your works are either going to be wood, hay, and stubble, or they're going to be gold refined in the fire. Mm -hmm. And it's also interesting because the word of God says something very fascinating about the elders. It says the elders will worship him and throw their crowns at his feet. Mm -hmm. Where did those crowns come from? Those crowns came from the things that they did on earth through intimacy with Jesus, his way that were pleasing to him, that manifested in crowns that they were given. Mm -hmm. And it's very interesting because the word says there's five kinds of crowns. Mm -hmm. The word says there's an imperishable, there's an imperishable crown that comes out of 1 Corinthians 9, 24 to 25. The word says there's a crown of rejoicing that comes out of 1 Thessalonians 2.19. The word says there's a crown of righteousness. That's 2 Timothy 4.8. The word says there's a crown of glory. 1 Peter 5.4. And the word says there's a crown of life. Revelation 2.10. So the word mentions at least five crowns. Where do they come from? Works done out of intimacy with Jesus, his way, as initiated by the Holy Spirit. Crowns come out of that. Is that interesting to anybody? Yes. And by the way, in the Hebrew, what's a crown a picture of? 
It's a picture of authority and rulership. Mm -hmm. And what are we? We're a royal priesthood and a holy nation. And what are we to be doing? Subduing the earth and bringing it under subjection to him. We are to rule and reign as kings and priests here in the earth. I believe the more we do that, the more crowns we have in heaven. As we rule and reign as priestly kings here on earth, we have more crowns in heaven. It's only done through intimacy with Jesus. Is anybody hearing this word? Mm -hmm. Let's go to Revelation chapter 4 and verse 9. Anybody enjoying this word today? Yes. Revelation 4 9. God was just downloading this to me yesterday. I asked Holy Spirit, is this going to be released today? The Lord said, absolutely. Revelation 4 9. Listen to this, guys. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders, 24 elders, who are they? 12 from the old covenant, 12 from the new covenant. That's a whole other teaching, but that's who they are, or that's where they come from. Okay, The Lord knows who they are exactly. The 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. And as part of their worship, they lay their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by you, oh, they were created and have their being. Let me ask you a question. Does the word say here that the Lord is the creator of all things? Mm -hmm. Did he ever stop creating? Mm -hmm. Why do we think he stopped creating at the end of the sixth day in Genesis 1 and 2? He's always creating. He just rested on the seventh day. The eighth day was the day of new beginnings. Tell me, guys, we, we are about to fulfill the sixth day and go into the seventh. And then the eighth day is in front of us. What is the end of the sixth day? It's the end of the age of the Gentiles. What's the seventh day? It's the age of the Jews turning to Christ and fulfilling Zechariah 12.10. And I will pour out upon Israel and Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication, and they'll look upon me whom they pierced and recognized me and long for me as one longs for an only son. Then the Jews and the Gentiles come together and worship Jesus. The Jews invite Jesus to come and sit on the throne. He comes... And then we go into the thousand year reign and that's the eighth day. How many receive that? Um, how many know we're living in the fulfillment of the sixth day right now? Okay. Now, can I springboard into something else before we wrap up? Absolutely. Okay. That we got the, the energy to do this? Okay. Stay with me and think about everything we just talked about in Revelation 2, cross-referencing Isaiah 58. Now I want to talk to you about something that God really, really, really put on my heart for us that's very, very important. Revelation 4, 9 through 11 is an act of worship. The elders lay their crowns at his feet. Now if they lay them at his feet every time as an act of worship when the creatures right are crying out, Holy, holy is the Lord, then they must pick them back up again and put the crowns on their heads. Anybody catching that? Lay it down as an act of worship. Pick it up again. Lay it down as an act of worship. Which means what? You're going to take your works done through intimacy with Jesus with you into eternity. The crown of life is reserved for those who endure until the yeah. end. And as an act of worship, we'll just keep putting them at Jesus' feet because you alone are worthy. You alone are worthy. How many know you want to have a crown or crowns to put at his feet as yes. part of that act of worship? Yes. Trust me. And once you breathe your last breath, the ability to gain those crowns is over. So what does the Lord want us to do? Purpose in our heart that we are going to endure until the very end. 
guy that I, I used to really enjoy when I first went into ministry, really enjoyed reading his books and listening to his teachings. They were on cassette tapes back in that day. Yeah. Anybody remember cassette tapes? Yeah. And I still have cassette tapes. Yeah. You can go into my dad's office at his house and there's hundreds of cassette tapes on the wall. I'm like, Dad, you still have a cassette player? <laughs> right? And it's all that anointed teaching on the walls around him, right? That's just that's just my dad. But listen to this guy. He's with the, with the Lord now. He, uh, his name was James Ryle. He helped uh, pioneer promise keepers back in the day. Okay, um, no, James Ryle. So, and, and he's the one that wrote the book Hippo in the Garden that I talk about every once in a while. God's going to do things in the church at the end of the age that will seem as strange as a man walking a hippo on a leash in a garden. Okay, that's James Ryle. So God gave him a vision one day, and in this vision, he walks up to an old round wooden door like he'd find um, to get into an old, old stone building back in the day. And he said he looked at it and he saw the words vision, faith, and courage manifest on that door. Now this is important. Vision, faith, and courage. And he said, the Lord said, in faith, press that door open. And he pushed the door open and he saw a long hallway and as he's walking down this hallway, the word perseverance is written on the hallway. When he gets to the end of the hallway, he comes into a room, and that room is a throne room with a throne and steps, and on the right side of the throne, there's a crown hanging there on the throne. And the Holy Spirit said to him, this is the crown of life that is reserved for those who persevere until the end. He said, I give a man vision and then I give him the faith and the courage to walk it out. He says as he walks it out, he has to walk in unwavering perseverance and when he gets to the end of the hallway of life, he will walk into the throne room where the crown is, the crown of life that's in, that is reserved for those who endure until the end, and he'll lay that crown at my feet continually for all of eternity. How many are hearing this? Okay. So the Lord's talking to me yesterday about ruling and reigning. See, we receive the crown when we walk as kings and priests here on earth. Has anybody ever read that in the Word? What does that look like? What does subduing the earth look like? What does walking as kings and priests here on the earth look like? God is about to bring the church into a realm or dimension of warfare like we've never been in before. If you are a seer and God is increasing your seeing anointing, it's because you're a part of this. If you're a prophet and God is increasing your prophetic anointing, it's because of this. The seers are rising up in the Lord and the seers are going to look into the realm of the Spirit and give greater divine strategy for the end times church to walk out and use against the enemy than in any other generation. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. These things are not happening by happenstance. And the church is going to walk into a realm of victory and spiritual warfare like we've never walked in before. Victory through intimacy. Yeah. We're going to learn to rule and reign here on earth. And then we're going to take the crowns off of the heads of the kings of the earth. See, you're going to receive crowns not only for the works you did out of intimacy with Jesus, we're also, as kings and priests ruling in the earth, going to take the crowns off the heads of kings. Okay, Pastor, I, I need some uh, biblical reference on this. I'm glad you asked. <laughs> Let's go to 2 Samuel chapter 7. 2 Samuel chapter 7. Now, this is important. This is important. Okay, grab a hold of this because God is going to tie a bow around this real quick and we're going to wrap up, but you don't want to miss the revelation that he's about to release. Let me ask you about King David. Was King David a type? Yes. King David in the Old Testament was the clearest picture of Christ that we see in any other person that was a type in the Old Testament. What do you mean by a type? 
Joseph was a type. He was a picture of Jesus and salvation and preservation of the earth. How many are catching this? He was a picture of the Prince of Peace. He was the prince who ruled amongst his brethren. Anybody, anybody catching this? David, more than anybody else, was a type of Christ in the Old Testament. He was prophet, priest, and king. He walked in the threefold expression that we're supposed to at the end of the age. At the end of the age, those that are intimate with Jesus are going to walk in the prophet, priestly, and kingly anointing. What's the prophet? What's the prophet's anointing? Hearing the voice of God and decreeing and declaring it and shifting the atmospheres. And that word happening now very quickly. No sooner is the word going to be spoken from your mouth it's going to manifest in front of you. Be careful what you're speaking. What is the kingly anointing ruling and reigning here on earth and bring it into submission to him? What is the priestly anointing standing before the throne of God in intercession and interceding for people? Yes. That's the prophet, priestly, and kingly anointing very quick in a couple sentences. Now we need to understand this. Is David a picture of Christ? Yes. Did Jesus say greater things than what I did you will do? Yes. Notice what David, the type of Christ, does in 2 Samuel, verse 29. David is coming through Rabbah, through the leader of his army. And the leader of his army, Joab, tells David, you better muster your troops because the city's about to fall, and if it falls and you're not here, I'm going to take the glory for it. Joab is a picture of the church trying to do it in their own strength at the end of the age. David, a type of Christ, musters all his troops and they go and they conquer the city. Now I want you to notice what the word says. Verse 29, so David mustered the entire army and went to Rabbah and attacked and captured it. He took the crown from the, from the head of their king and it weighed a talent of gold, and it was set with precious stones, and it was placed on David's head. And he took a great quantity of plunder from the city. He also then went in and took the people from the city and conspired them and used them to help in his building projects. Now, how many think that's kind of an interesting page from David's life? Okay. Well, let's talk about this. Because Holy Spirit was talking to me about this yesterday. What was the name of the city that he conquered? Rabbah. Rabbah in the Hebrew means great, powerful, and contentious. Rabbah is a picture of strongholds at the end of the age that the Davids of this generation are going to fight against and conquer for this. His name was Malcolm. It can also be translated Molech. Molech was the king that initiated child sacrifice. And David took the crown off his head. What is Molech a picture of? Abortion and the destruction the enemy has tried to bring against the end times generation so they can't rise up and welcome Jesus to come and sit upon the throne of David. Now grab a hold of this. David, a type of Christ, conquers a city that was a contentious stronghold, goes to its king, Molech, and takes the crown off his head. What is the crown a picture of? Authority, kingship, rulership. Takes it from him and puts it on his head because he took his territory, he took his authority, he took his spoils. Hallelujah. Oh. See, that's the generation that through intimacy with Jesus is going to be taken to a realm of warfare Victory warfare against the enemy like we've never seen in previous generations. Now grab a hold of this. How many know in the Old Covenant there wasn't an anointing and authority to cast out demons? 
That's why when Jesus came along and started casting out demons, the Jews started going, whoa, 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 what is this? Mm -hmm. what, what is this? Even the demons are subject unto him. Mm -hmm. And what did Jesus say about us? Greater things than what he did, we will do. Here's David, a type of Christ, who conquers the contentious stronghold, takes the crown off of Molech's head, brings an end to his child sacrifice, picture of abortion, and the destruction going on against the youth in this generation. Come on, guys. Takes the crown off his head and puts it on his and takes everything he has. He defeated the strong man and he robbed his house. Yeah. And he took his land. Then what does Jesus do? He's about to go to Calvary and what do they do? They put a crown on his head. Mm -hmm. A crown of thorns. As they're whipping him and beating him. They're ripping his garments off of him. They crucify him. He says, it is finished. He took the crown off the head of the enemy. Yeah. In that process... Greater things than what he did we will do. What are we to do now? Take the crowns off the heads of the kings that rule the earth. And put them on our heads. And take their territory and spoil their goods. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Um, is, is anybody hearing us? Mm -hmm. And let me tell you what, because this is interesting. The crown he takes off Molech's head weighed 75 pounds. Mm -hmm. It's one talent of gold. Tell me that was not a supernatural enemy. Mm -hmm. Imagine a 75 pound object being placed on your head. Tell me that there is not something demonic that was going on with Molech beside the child sacrifices. By the way, Molech was a spirit. Molech was a false god that Israel battled throughout the Old Testament. And they would worship Molech. When they went away from God, there was a huge metal statue that they had in the valley of Ben-Hinnon and they would build a fire in this thing at night and it would glow red and its hands would be out and they would take their babies and put their babies on the glowing red hands. The heat would make the baby squirm and the baby would fall off into the fire. Mm -hmm. And whenever Israel went into revival, they tore down the shrines of Molech. Mm -hmm. God's about to bring revival and the final crown is going to be taken off the head of Molech. Hallelujah. And God's people are going to take the crowns off of the heads of earthly kings. They're not going to take the crowns off the heads of earthly kings. They are going to display to the principalities, powers, and wickedness in high places who our God is. Hallelujah. I don't think you're getting half as excited about this as you should, but that's okay. <laughs> By the way, this crown was gold, and gold in the Bible is a picture of God's blessing and protection. The crown had gems in it, and gems in the realm of the spirit represent value, beauty, and durability. And you know what's interesting? When you look at the New Jerusalem, it has streets of gold, and gems are in its foundation. Isn't that interesting? Is anybody going kind of, hmm, very, very interesting. What is God saying to us? He wants us to use the gifts and abilities that he's giving us, that he's given us, through intimacy with him to take the crowns off of the heads of the rulers of the earth in our generation. Okay, one more thing. So Friday night in prayer, Okay, we started the burn on Wednesday night. How many are thankful for Sister Jean? Yes. Who yes. does a great job with our house of prayer. Amen. So next one, by the way, see what's going to be there on the board. Starts on Wednesday night. It's percolating by the time we get here on Friday nights for, for intercessory prayer. The Lord tells me in the parking lot this is going to be a very different night. We come in, and it was a very prophetic night, a lot of prophetic words. It was also a night where we were <laughs> in the word deep, and the prophetic and the word just kept intertwining. <clears throat> it was absolutely beautiful in the Lord. About midway through the night, we're praying, and I saw two words in the Spirit. 
And, and you know me, I, I don't say this stuff unless I see it and it doesn't happen all the time. But I'm there in my chair and I see Cyrus anointing wow. while we're praying. Cyrus anointing. And I just start praying and I said, Lord, I just ask that you pour out on us the Cyrus anointing. And we just start praying into the Cyrus anointing. Now, I want to wrap up with this because this is really, really important in him. Let's go to Isaiah 45. Isaiah 45, and Hannah, this is my third wrap up. <laughs> Hallelujah. Isaiah 45. I want to point this out. I've been talking a lot about the Issachar anointing. What is the Issachar anointing? Is the anointing that the men from the tribe of Issachar came to David with when they were helping raise him up onto the throne God promised him. David is a type. So the Issachar anointing is an anointing that will be used at the end of the age to lift Jesus up and usher his second coming in. It's an anointing to understand the times and the seasons and what we are to do. That's three aspects of the Issachar anointing. There's also a wealth aspect to the Issachar anointing because not only did Jacob speak over all 12 tribes in Genesis 49, Moses did also before he passed. And what Moses spoke of the tribe of Issachar, which was known as the tribe that knew the word better than the priests. They understood the law. They understood the times and seasons. They walked in a dimension of discernment that the other twelve tribe, the other eleven tribes didn't. Moses promised them the Lord was going to bless them with the wealth of the seas and of the sands. The Issachar anointing and the Cyrus anointing are both beginning to be poured out over God's people, and they fit like this. Let me show you how. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. So in Isaiah 45, we begin to realize something as we study Isaiah. Isaiah prophesied the, two, the coming of two very important people. The first one was Messiah. In fact, Isaiah prophesies more about Messiah coming than any other prophets in the Old Testament and all of them put together. He prophesies more than them all about Messiah coming. Why did he call him a man? Well, he was the God man, right? Son of God, son of man. The second most important person that he prophesies about is Cyrus. In Isaiah 45, he prophesies about Cyrus coming 100 to 200 years before this man is ever born. <laughs> How do they know? That was a multi-dimensional prophecy that God was speaking through Isaiah. Why do you say 100 to 200 years? Because some... Some theologians will say it was 100 years, others 150 years, other 200 years. So somewhere between, grab a hold of this, guys. Somewhere between 100 and 200 years, this is one of the only people in the Word that is prophesied about by name before they're born. Mm -hmm. Tell me he's not of significance. Mm -hmm. And he's not even a Jew, which makes this even more interesting. He's a Persian, is who he is, which is absolutely fascinating. And his name means one who possesses the furnace. What was Cyrus going to do? And it ties in the Rabbah. All of this is connected. This is very, very important. This will be worth delaying your lunch over, I promise, in, in, in the Lord here. Okay, so... His name means, this is important, one who possesses the furnace. How do he know that Nebuchadnezzar possessed the furnace? And what did he do with that furnace? He threw in Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Because they stood and wouldn't worship his statue. And it's a picture of a generation at the end of the age who will not bow down to the idols of their generation. And because of that, they're going to be thrown into the fire. God's fire. So what happens when they throw the three Hebrew boys in? Number one, the very strong men that threw them in died because the flames leaped out and killed them because they fired up the furnace seven times hotter. Do you know how warm a furnace has to be to refine gold? 
seven times hotter than what you do to refine silver. And God says, my people are going to transition from being like silver to being like gold. Mm -hmm. And there's going to be a seven times hotter furnace that's going to bring that about. Mm -hmm. That's a whole nother word. So Nebuchadnezzar looks in the furnace and goes, wait a minute. Wasn't there three Hebrew boys that were in that furnace? And there's another one walking around there with them. And he looks like the sons of the gods. He saw Jesus in the furnace. But you know what Nebuchadnezzar does? He doesn't call all four of them out. He just says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, come out! He didn't want anything to do with the one that looked like the son of the gods. <laughs> right? And what did God do? He used Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah to show a wicked king with the nation that he oversaw Babylon, which is a picture of the world system. God used those four young men to stand and show Nebuchadnezzar who God was. But Nebuchadnezzar kind of goes in and out of recognizing who God is and does his own thing and even gets turned into a strange eagle looking like talons and feathery creature for seven years and God restores him. And then his son or nephew, they don't know for sure, comes on the throne and he's the one who's having a big party one night and doing all kinds of debaucherous things. And right in the middle of the party, he has a bright idea. Go and get the golden cups that they used in the temple of the God in Israel and let us fill them with wine and toast our gods with them. Mm -hmm. Oh, you should have gone to get the cups from some other God's temple mm -hmm. instead of that there, Belteshazzar, because we've got a problem. Mm -hmm. And so he brings them in, they're drinking out of them, and then the handwriting happens on the wall. Mm -hmm. You've been weighed in the scales and you've been found lacking. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that night something happens. The Babylonian Empire, the head and the upper torso of the statue that Nebuchadnezzar saw in his dream, which represented Babylon, mm -hmm. is going to come to an end. Mm -hmm. And let me tell you who did it. It was Cyrus. Mm -hmm. Now God is pouring out the the Cyrus, yes, Lord, anointing, he and Lord, over his people. And let me tell you how Cyrus overthrew Babylon. Babylon had a mighty river that flowed right through it. And it was gated on both ends, and the gates went across this river, and it was walled all the way around in the other areas. But there was this large iron gate and a river that flowed underneath. You know what happened while the handwriting was going on the wall? Cyrus and his men dammed up the river. The river stopped flowing and they went under the day of 45. And don't look at the man. Look at the anointing that he represents. Because this is important. So the Lord says, this is what the Lord says to his anointed. Now it's interesting because his anointed in Hebrew can also mean Messiah. Now, he's not calling Cyrus Messiah. He's saying Cyrus is a type. Mm -hmm. Grab a hold of that. He's a picture. He says, this is what I say to my anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I take hold of. He's saying this 100 and, 100 and 200 years before this man's even born. He's prophesying this. This is our God. He sees the end from the beginning. He's standing at the end and he's prophesying Cyrus before Cyrus is ever in his mother's womb. Mm -hmm. That's how awesome our God is. He calls him by name. Amen. Oh, this is so powerful. He says, whose right hand, in the Hebrew, the right hand is the hand of power. Whose right hand I take hold of to subdue nations before him and to strip kings of their armor. See, I start to go, wait a minute. Hold on. To open doors before him. And the word doors there in Hebrew is double doors before him. So the gates will not be shut. I will go before you and will level mountains. Isn't that interesting? I will break down gates of bronze and I will cut through bars of iron. It's being prophesied how he's going to overthrow the Babylonian kingdom, the empire, right here. He's going to go under the gates. 
I will give you the treasures of darkness in the riches stored in secret places so that you may know that I am the Lord, the God of Israel who summons you by name. And for the sake of Jacob, my servant, of Israel, my chosen, I summon you by name and bestow upon you a title of honor, though you did not acknowledge me. Now tell me, this doesn't sound like some things God was speaking this morning in interpretation of tongues. I am the Lord and there is no other. Apart from me, there is no other God. I will strengthen you, though you have not acknowledged me. So why? Why? Why is God going to strengthen a Persian man who doesn't know him? So that from the rising of the sun to the place of its setting, men may know that there is none besides me. I am the Lord and there is no other. Why did God send Israel down to Egypt, not just to preserve them, but to show Pharaoh that he was God? Why did God send Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah into Babylon to show Nebuchadnezzar that he is God? Why did God raise up Cyrus so he could overthrow the Babylonian kingdom and show the earth who God is? He wants to use this end times generation to show the earth who he is. By giving them the Cyrus anointing. Now notice this. He said, I form the light and I create the darkness. I bring prosperity and I create disaster. I, the Lord, will do all these things. Um, is anybody um, getting excited about the Lord? Yes. Notice verse 8. You heavens above rain down righteousness and let the clouds shower it down. Let the earth open wide and let salvation spring up. Let righteousness grow with it. I, the Lord, have created it. Next verse, woe to him who quarrels with his maker. <laughs> do you know what God's going to do according to the prophecy of Isaiah 45? And by the way, I believe Isaiah 45 has a two-part fulfillment. I believe the first fulfillment, which is the former reign fulfillment, is in the days of the actual man, King Cyrus. I believe the final and greatest fulfillment, which is the latter rain fulfillment of this prophetic word, is coming upon us right now. Right. See, we've got to understand this. From Joel to Amos to Isaiah and many of the other prophets in the Old Testament, prophetic words were spoken that had multiple fulfillments, but with all of them, the greatest fulfillment is at the end of the age. Right. Amen. And we are part of that fulfillment that's why at the wedding feast of Canaan and Galilee, the chief guest said, you saved the best wine for last. Why? Because now the greatest one Isaiah prophesied over had come. Messiah. And the best wine that he saved for last was on the horizon. But Pastor, that was 2,000 years ago. Yes, but 1,000 years this is a day. And a day is 1,000 years. That was two days ago to the Lord. Somebody can say our God's awesome if you want to. Awesome. My God is awesome. You know, it's amazing when the Lord starts releasing rhema in the room. There's just a shifting. Mm -hmm. And and you all have enjoyed the word up to this point, but when the revelation started, I saw the hunger begin to come. That is so beautiful in the Lord. So we're sitting there on the prayer carpet, and I had looked at the, the that passage about Cyrus. Last time I preached on Cyrus, we were in the West Wing. 18 years ago. Wow. The Lord had me preach on Cyrus. And so we're praying along and I see in the spirit with my eyes closed, I saw a black background and white letters at an angle. I saw Cyrus anointing. And so I just started praying it. Lord, I just asked that you would pour out the Cyrus anointing. And I just started praying it. Well, Sister Jean grabs a hold of it immediately and she starts looking at it and talking a little bit about it. And then on your Saturday, the Lord said, okay, bring this into the Word. I said, Lord, it's going to be a long word. He said, bring it into the Word. I said, yes, Lord. Okay. So I want to give you some aspects as we close of the Cyrus anointing. Because this is important. So number one is they means one who possesses the furnace. See, Nebuchadnezzar possessed the furnace. But the fire that God is bringing at the end of the age is going to be completely different. And we're going to see that our God is an all-consuming fire. See, John baptized in water 
But John said, one is coming after me who will baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Meaning those who walk in the Cyrus anointing at the end of the age will carry the fire of God. Remember the road to Emmaus? The two are coming back after Jesus is revealed. And what did they say? When he explained the scriptures to us, did not our hearts burn within us? See, Old Testament, we see this God who's an all-consuming fire. And then Jesus comes. And we lose track of the fact that He's the all-consuming fire. But at the end of the age, He'll be the all-consuming fire through the Cyrus generation. Hallelujah. And that fire will burn up everything that's not of God and will refine and purify everything that is. That's why many of you right now are going through the fire. You're being refined. God's dealing with things. Because the fire can't come through you until the fire has refined you. Oh, I don't think anybody heard that one. See, God can't release the fire through you at the end of the age until the fire's refined you. Because he won't release his fire through impurity. That's why holiness, purity, and the fear of the Lord are the greatest aspects of the end times revival. Those that are in it, those Cyruses, are going to walk in holiness, purity, and the fear of the Lord. And the enemy right now, right now hates this message. Okay. So what is the Cyrus anointing? No, I don't want to glorify... Okay, Lord, I won't do that. All right. So we've got to understand this. The Cyrus anointing is an anointing that brings a victory in confrontation over God's people. The Cyrus anointing is an anointing that when it's poured out over you, it's an anointing to bring victory in confrontation. Right now there's a lot of people in the church that they don't like confrontation. Okay. Let me take a little poll here. How many in the room enjoy confrontation? One, two. Okay, we've got a couple of folks that are listening. There's three, there's an eagle. Okay, got it. So 90% of this house doesn't enjoy confrontation. Here's the thing. We're in a spiritual battle and we're called to win. We're called to stand in victory. So when the Cyrus anointing comes over you, it's an anointing to be victorious in confrontation. Come on. So what does Cyrus do? He dries up the river. See, those that walk in the Cyrus anointing are going to dry up the rivers of the enemy. They're going to make the high places low and the low places high. Okay, now let's get into what are the actual aspects of it. By the way, this, the Cyrus anointing is multifaceted. Mm -hmm. Don't ask me to give you one point that encapsulates the Cyrus anointing because it's multidimensional. Which you know what that tells me? Those who walk in the Cyrus anointing are multidimensional people. That's why God said to put that sign out there in the foyer. The Refuge Ministry Center International. We are multidimensional, multifaceted, multicultural, multigenerational. God said, stop praying it and write the vision plainly on the wall. Yes. That's why it's there. Those who walk in the Cyrus anointing is an anointing of the keepers of the furnace. It's a fire anointing. Let me tell you officially what it is. Number one. The Cyrus anointing is a, is a picture of the Jews and the Gentiles coming together to accomplish the will of the Lord at the end of the age. Because what did Cyrus do? Cyrus released the exiles from Babylon to go back into the southern kingdom of Israel to rebuild the wall and rebuild the temple that Nebuchadnezzar destroyed. What are you trying to say, Pastor? That the Babylonian system of the world has destroyed the church. Yes. God is raising up a generation with the Cyrus anointing that will rebuild the walls and you will be a repairer of broken walls and will rebuild the church the way it's supposed to be. Yes. That's why you keep hearing me say at the end of the age, yeah. the end times church is going to look like nothing the earth has ever seen before. Yes. 
But see, here is Cyrus, a Gentile, partnering with the Jews to accomplish the will of God. See, it's the Cyrus anointing that will bring the Gentiles and the Jews together at the end of the age to usher in the Lord's return. Is anybody catching this? Number two, it's an anointing that's poured out on the end times church to pull down the Babylonian system at the end of the age. Amen. Because what did he do? He went underneath their defenses. He, he dried up their river and he went in and he conquered Babylon. And we move them from the golden portion of the statue to the silver portion of the statue. Is anybody hearing this? Now I'm going to make an interesting statement here. This part of a whole other message that's coming when the Holy Spirit says it's time. There's been a battle in the realm of the spirits that has been going on for generations and generations and generations between the sons of Zion and the sons of Greece. It's very interesting. Paul says when we're saved, we're grafted into yeah. the vine. Mm -hmm. Why is God trying to shift the Gentile church from a Greek mindset to a Hebrew mindset? That's right. Because we're not a part of the Greek army. Yeah. We're a part of the Hebrew army, the army of Zion. Yeah. Hallelujah. Is anybody getting this? Yeah. Okay, that's why there's a war right now trying to keep the Gentile church stuck in the Greek. Yes. Stuck in the system. Where did the church system come from? Constantine. What did Constantine do? He was a conqueror in the statue that Nebuchadnezzar saw. He conquered, and what he did was he took Christianity and he mingled it with pagan temple worship and he created this worldwide religion of mixture. Yes. Which is why in the church today we don't celebrate yes. Resurrection Sunday. We celebrate Ishtar. Uh -huh. Ishtar. Ishtar. Anybody hearing this? Mm -hmm. That's why we've got pagan holidays in the church. I say this in love. Yeah. Thank you, Constantine. Mm -hmm. But he did that. And it was part of that Ebenezer statue. Okay. What is it thirdly? Oh, this is so important. It opens the doors to allow God's people to access their inheritance and blessings. Now, when a lot of preachers preach the Cyrus anointing, they preach the prosperity side of it. I'm not going to do that. But it is an anointing for you to access what the enemy has stolen and the locust and canker worm have eaten from you and your family all the way back to Adam and Eve. Yeah. It's an anointing to access the wealth of the wicked that he's pouring out on the righteous. But not to get all we can and can't all we get and say that we've got a big mansion on the hill and seven cars that shows the town below who God is. Baloney. Baloney. What it is, is it's an anointing to raise up end-time Cyrus financiers to finance the Lord's end-time kingdom work. Okay. Let me tell you what I believe God said that the finances are going to do. He's raising up end-time financiers walking in the Cyrus anointing. They are going to give 95% of what God gives them into the kingdom. Yes. And they're going to live on 5%. Yes. And they could have mansions and a bunch of cars and a bunch of other things, but they're going to say, no, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And the financier anointing is a calling at the end of the age. And I will walk in that calling. I will not worship wealth. I will worship the giver of wealth, yes. the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Yes. They are going to be that radical and that sold out. And they're going to see wealth not as a right of prosperity mm -hmm. yeah. and a justification they are going to see wealth as a tool to finance the end times yes. kingdom. Hallelujah! Yes. Yes. How many received that? Mm -hmm. See, the enemy took the prosperity message, which was good. Does God want to bless us? Yes. Does God want to prosper us? Yeah. Okay, we see the Abraham's blessing ours. Sure it is. But you're blessed to be a blessing. Mm -hmm. He said through Abraham, I'll bless those who curse you. I'll bless those who bless you. I'll curse those who curse you. I'm going to bless all the nations of the earth through you. It's a blessing to be a blessing. Yeah. And right now, if you begin handling wealth in the way I'm describing, tithing is a key, mm -hmm. offering is a key, mm -hmm. 
living more fasted lifestyle so you can fund what God is doing more. Mm -hmm. And notice I have not given anyone the tithely link as I'm saying this mm -hmm. for this house. See, when we get in alignment with God and what he's doing, the blessings flow. Mm -hmm. The anointing flows. Okay. How many are enjoying this work? Okay. All right. Fourthly, the Cyrus anointing is given to loosen the armor of kings. What does it mean to loosen the armor of kings? To tear down their defenses. Those kings are kings here on earth, but they're also kings in the second heaven. Mm -hmm. Principalities, powers, and wickedness in high places. If any of these points are causing your heart to stir, that's an aspect of the Cyrus anointing that you're called to. Okay? Fifthly, it's an anointing to open doors. It breaks down doors. Oh, grab a hold of this. It's an anointing to open doors. It breaks down doors that other generations in the church were not able to open, and it keeps them open. See, the Lord is saying in the Cyrus anointing, the end times generation is going to be able to open doors that the previous generations in the church couldn't budge. Mm -hmm. And the Word says not just to open doors, to open double doors. Mm -hmm. Open up the gates wide so that the King of Glory can come in. See, in the Sahara, God's been waiting to pour out the Cyrus anointing on the end times generation because when that anointing is poured out, the Lord knows that anointing ushers in the end. So he could not pour it out until the end of the age because if it was poured out early, it would speed things up too quickly. He's the God of the times and the seasons. How many are catching this? Amen. How many are enjoying this? Amen. Good. Number six, it's an anointing to break the gates of bronze. Yeah. What do the gates of bronze do? They hold back our inheritance as God's people. Because let me ask you a question. What was inside the treasuries of the city of Babylon? All the gold and all the precious items taken from the temple in Jerusalem. What was holding back the people from getting those? The gates of bronze. Mm -hmm. It's an anointing to tear down the gates that are holding back God's inheritance that belong to his people. The yes. inheritance isn't just financial. It's also rhema that's been hidden. Strategy yes. that's been hidden. Things the enemy has locked away to try to keep God's people from getting to because he knows the moment they get to these things, they're going to use them against them and they're going to walk in that high level of victory that the Lord was talking about just a few moments ago. Oh, somebody better get excited in this house. Hallelujah. Number seven, what does it do? It releases treasures that are hidden in darkness. Yes. Now, this is going to tie into number six, but this is part of it in seven. Things the enemy has stolen that God wants to bring to light and fulfill. Yes. Hallelujah, glory. Is anybody going, this has resonated with everything I've been feeling, but I didn't know how to say it. Mm -hmm. Right? I just didn't know how to say it, but this is it. It's the Cyrus anointing. Okay, it's the Cyrus anointing. Interesting, 18 years ago was the last time God said to teach on this. 18 years ago. Preached on it and they said, stop. 18 years later in the prayer circle, boom, God reintroduces it. Tells me we're coming into a strategic time of the Lord where we need the Cyrus anointing. And while I was praying, was, pre was, was praying through the Cyrus anointing, I was standing up and I felt like something that was 100 pounds was dropped on me. It just felt heavy. And I felt like the Lord saying, I'm dropping the Cyrus anointing. Pouring out that Cyrus anointing. I felt like my body was full of concrete. Just heavy and strong and thick. This anointing God was pouring out. And we, I just give the Lord the glory with that. He's, he's, he's pouring out on me. He's pouring out on all of us. Amen. Pardon me. That's interesting. 18 in Hebrew means life. Amen. Okay, number eight. Ooh, hallelujah. This anointing also is strategic. It's kairos. 
because it allows things that God has hidden for this generation to be revealed. See, in the previous point, it was things the enemy had hidden. In this point, it's the things that God has hidden. It's the glory of God to conceal a matter. It's the glory of kings to search it out. So we need to understand something right now. Man, the spirit of revelation is all over this room. There are things the enemy has hidden from the church up until this point because he knew the moment we laid hold of these things, we would use them against him and we would overcome an area as previous generations in the church hasn't been able to. But there's also an element of this anointing that uncovers secret things of God that he has hidden for this generation. There's two sides of it. By the way, let me say this here. All of this is accomplished through intimacy with Jesus. Without intimacy with Jesus, he will not trust you. He will not entrust you with the Cyrus anointing. Because you'll want it for the wrong reasons and you'll use it in a way that vexes the Holy Ghost. So in every segment of what God has been teaching today, intimacy is the key in every one. Through intimacy, you won't have works that the Lord says are worthless. Through intimacy with Jesus, you'll have crowns to throw at his feet. Through intimacy with Jesus, you will take crowns off of kings' heads. Through intimacy with Jesus, you will walk in the Cyrus anointing. Let's keep this balanced. I don't want you running out of here today being excited about the Cyrus anointing. I want you to walk out of this place today excited about Jesus, who's going to give you the Cyrus anointing. Okay. Every anointing has to be balanced. The fruits of the Spirit keep the gifts of the Spirit in check. You can have a powerful prophetic anointing, but you better have love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, kindness, meekness, and self-control. Is anybody catching this? This is very, very important. And number nine, final point of the Cyrus anointing that I want to bring up is this. It's to build the house of prayer at the end of the age to fulfill Amos 9.11. It is to build the house of prayer at the end of the age to fulfill Amos 9.11. Pastor Cindy, final passage. Can you give us Amos 9.11? This is a passage God has been having me pray months and months and months and months and months and months and months. It's another one that when I heard it, it's never left my spirit. In Amos 9.11, the Lord says this. He says, in that day, now this is a minor prophet in the Old Testament. We have now gone from in that day to it is this day. So let's take out that and put in this. In this day, the Lord says, I will restore David's fallen shelter or tent or tabernacle. What was it? When David brings back the Ark of the Covenant the second time, first time he didn't do it God's way and somebody died, one of his mighty men. Second time, he gets the priests and the poles and they do it right and he's coming into the city, but instead of going over to the left side of Jerusalem, the mountain where Moses' tabernacle is still in use, he veers off to the right. And what David does is he takes the Ark of the Covenant and he puts it under a simple curtain. And for 40 years out of his own treasury, he hires prophets, priests, musicians, singers, and folks reading the word that are doing that 24-7 at that tent for 40 years. You know what happened during after that happened? Moses' tabernacle was still in use over on the other mountain because the temple hadn't been built yet by Solomon. And they were still doing all the same religious stuff at Moses' tabernacle. But guess what wasn't there anymore? The Ark of the Covenant. And what did the Ark of the Covenant represent? The manifest presence of God. What is that? The two churches at the end of the age. The church at Moses Tabernacle are doing all the religious stuff and they're doing what Ephesus did. What is the church church doing at David's Tabernacle? They're rebuilding the house of prayer. He said, and in this day I will restore David's fallen shelter. I will repair its broken walls and restore its ruins. 
and I will rebuild it as it used to be. Very few things does God ever want to build it as it used to be. Yeah. This is one of them. And the Lord didn't say, and I will rebuild Moses' tabernacle. Wow, Moses' tabernacle he got from a blueprint from heaven. But David's tent was what was close to the heart of Jesus. It was like Eden on earth. Are we catching this? And it was a very special place to the heart of God. So God didn't say I was going to rebuild Moses' fallen tabernacle. He didn't even say I'm going to rebuild Solomon's temple. He said, I'm going to rebuild David's fallen tent. The Ark of the Covenant separated from common people by a sheet. Gentiles could never get that close in the temple structure. Or even Moses' tabernacle. Even most Jews couldn't get that close. You could stand a curtain away from the Ark in David's tabernacle or David's tent. And can you imagine if for 40 years people were harp and bowling there day and night, what the presence of the Lord was like at that place? The Lord says, that is what I want the church at the end of the age to look like. David's fallen tent. Amen. Not a grand crystal cathedral full of religion but a simple tent with this manifest presence that transforms lives. And he's going to do it by putting Cyrus's in place to break down the gates of the enemy, take crowns off king's heads, to take what the enemy has been holding back behind his bronze gates and iron bars, and to lay hold of what God has hidden for this generation. For the building of things the way God wants to build. Mm -hmm. That's what God says I'm about to do. Yes. So I asked the Lord, do you want part of this message delivered? All this message delivered? It's going to be a long word. The Lord said, you deliver the whole thing the way I gave it to you. Yeah. So that's what you got today. Yeah. <laughs> Hallelujah. And I kept praying the whole time, God, help me just speak this the way you want it spoken. Because it is substantial in the realm of spirit. Yes. Now what we need to understand is this, guys. For everyone hearing this word in the sanctuary right now, in this listening in, this word is a breaker word. This is a word that in the realm of spirit broke things open. This is also a word in the realm of the spirit that breaks all heck loose. Because the enemy fought. The mental warfare I had during praise and worship today in the presence of God was so incredible. But the enemy just did not want this word delivered. Tried to bring confusion to me and all kinds of things. Not going to happen. Okay? Not going to happen. God wanted this word released today. First comes the knowledge. Then comes the test. This word broke things open in the realm of the Spirit so you can step into them and walk them out. But it also opened up the door for fire. Yeah. Refiner's fire and for warfare. And I want to let you know this. So if walk out of this place today in love with Jesus, yeah. wanting to press deeper into intimacy with him, excited that he wants to release the Cyrus anointing over you. But no, there's some things that are going to break loose over this one. Yes. There's some things that are going to break loose over this one. So if you've got a week that it's just a wonderful challenge. Okay? Know that it's because this word was for you. Stand in that challenge. Decree and declare the word of the Lord. Sing. May the joy of the Lord be your strength. Keep your eyes on Him. Keep pressing into Him. He is releasing the Cyrus anointing over your life. And the furnace of God will come forth from you. He's putting fresh anointing, fresh mantles, fresh weapons in your hands today. He's burning things away that need to be burned. He's calling forth things in your life that He spoke over you before He ever put you in your mother's womb. He's bringing you into strategic timing. He's pouring out His glory. He's moving over your life like never before. Expect, expect, expect the unexpected in the Lord. Yeah. Yeah.
over what God released in this place today. Because this word moved you and it moved a lot of things around you, whether you realize it or not. Can you just feel that in the room right now? Oh, shira ba kondi ba shira. Okay. Kian. Okay, God wants to. Lord said there's elements of the anointing that came in this teaching today, the Cyrus anointing that fell over you. The Lord said, now I want to release more. So I want to encourage you to put your hands out before the Lord right now. Put your hands out before the Lord. Put your hands out before the Lord right now. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I just got ready to put oil on everybody's hands. And the Lord said, I will release the oil from heaven. Hallelujah. Lord Jesus, I ask for the hands that are up to you in this room right now. Lord Jesus, I ask that the hands are up that for those that are listening to broadcast right now. Lord, I ask for... Woo, hallelujah, those lifted hands up that haven't heard the broadcast or are in here, but they feel the Spirit of God urging them to lift their hands up right now. Lord Jesus, we ask that you anoint us for deeper intimacy with you. Lord Jesus, we ask right now that you will remove barriers, strongholds, generational curses, things that have come in the family line, even our own stubbornness, our own willingness, our own desires. God, move that stuff out of the way, Lord, so that we can be intimate with you. Lord, even nullify words that we've spoken that hinder intimacy with you, God. We come out of agreement with those words right now, don't we, guys? Hallelujah. And Lord Jesus, we ask right now, that you will pour out a greater love for you than we've ever had before. A deeper anointing for intimacy with you. Just breathing deeply right now. God is just releasing things. Coming down from the ceiling right now. And Lord Jesus, I ask for your people right now. May you pour out the Cyrus anointing over them. Oh, as our hands are lifted up, Lord, may you pour out all nine aspects, facets of the Cyrus anointing over us. And Lord, may they activate, may they manifest as we press into intimacy with you. Lord, in every deeper realm of intimacy with you, may a deeper manifestation of the, the Cyrus anointing come upon our lives, Lord. Lord, I ask right now, because Lord, there's people listening to this broadcast from other nations. Lord, you desire to pour out the Cyrus anointing over them to touch their nation for you, God. Lord, I'm sensing people in the Middle East. I'm sensing people in India and Pakistan. Lord, I'm sensing people in Africa. Lord, that are listening to this broadcast. Lord, release the Cyrus anointing over them, Lord. Pour it out over them, Lord God Almighty. And Lord, may intimacy unlock every level of the Cyrus anointing. Ooh, yes, Lord. I just heard the Lord say, Andrew, I am here. Okay, Lord, what do you want to do? Yes, Lord. Just keep your hands up and receive. The king is in the room. Oh, hallelujah. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Lord Jesus, you're the desire of our hearts. Hallelujah. You are the Shekinah. You are the Kavod. You are the glory. Yes, Lord. Deeper realms. Deeper realms. Yes, Lord. He says, I'm pouring out deeper realms. Yes, Lord. Lord Jesus, may you be the first love of this church. And Lord, we repent if we have walked away from you in any area, Lord. We repent, we remember days of deeper intimacy. And we ask, Lord, that you'll take us back to those days, but more. The Lord said, when all of the elements, all of the or mind imagined what I have in store for those who love me. 
Hallelujah. The Lord says the Cyrus anointing is a real key to some things that we've been asking for. But intimacy puts the key in the lock and turns it. And the door opens. Lord Jesus, if there's anything we're doing in this house out of works, we repent, Lord. Bring us back to intimacy with you. Help us do the things we once did. And Lord, 72-hour prayer is part of the things we once did. Lord, that's why your blessing is on it so much. Thank you, Lord. Lord Jesus, I ask that your angels that are in this room would begin releasing things over us as you, the Lord of hosts, direct them. There's a lot of angels in this room right now. Ooh, let's breathe in, breathe out. Oh, somebody once said more things are caught than taught. You're breathing in things right now. Lord Jesus, I plead your blood over the week that we're all about to enter into. Lord, I ask for protection this week. Lord, I ask that you will guard this word. Lord, I ask God that you would cover us in your canopy, your chupa, your hoopah, Lord, so that we're protected as the enemy is raging over this word that was released. Lord, protect us. Protect our families, our finances, our identities. Lord, protect our jobs. Protect our relationships. Protect this house. Oh, does anybody in the room feel like your hands are getting heavy? Oh, whoa. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord Jesus, we love you. Just tell him that you love him. Lord Jesus, we love you. Lord Jesus, we love you. Oh, Yeshua. We love you. We love you. We love you. <laughs> yes, Lord. Yes, yeah, Sister Alice is going, Lord, we receive this. Just tell him you receive what he's pouring out right now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's just honor the Lord right now. You can keep your hands up. Bo. 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 Bo.
Lord Jesus, as you're dwelling amongst us, if there's anything you want to release in this room, Lord, release it. Church, just receive. This is not something we have to work for. It's just something he's freely pouring out. Just receive. There's anyone in this room that wants to have a relationship with Jesus but doesn't. It's a perfect time as he's in the room to just say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sin, Lord, and save me. Lord, I want to know you. I want to be filled with your Holy Spirit. Lord, I don't want to be a spectator. No, I want to be involved in everything that you're doing. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, Lord. Jesus, I ask that you would release burning in the hands of those, Lord, that are just crying out to you. Lord, release a holy burning in their hands, God. Lord, you said greater things than what you did we will do. Lord, release the burning in our hands, Lord. Lord, 
Lord Jesus, I ask that you would pour out your fire over this group. Lord, pour out your fire. Lord, pour out your fire. Lord, pour out your fire. Pour out your fire, Lord, over this group. Oh, Lord, we want to be your fire bride. Pour out your fire, Lord. Let's just say thank you right now to the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your presence in this place today. Thank you, Lord, for what you're pouring out on this place today. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We just say thank you, Lord, right now. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We bless your holy. 